<sighs> Does this one sound better? Are we back on track? I went to the old version of OBS. Could it be that an update made things worse? Could it fucking be? Could you imagine? A software update said it's fucking worse in every way! Could you fucking imagine? You fucking retards at OBS! I wish I had two dicks so you could suck both of them. Fuck you. Uh, yeah, well, we'll have to do that later. We'll have to do that way fucking later, won't we? Anyway. Here we are. We're back. We're back in black. Thanks for the sub. Let's, uh, let's get to what we were gonna do today, folks. Let's get into it. As soon as we find our music... Okay, no more anger, no more loud, loud screaming, no more violent rage. That's not what the depression chamber's about. We're here to be sad. <laughs> We're here to be sad. <laughs> All right. It's probably too quiet for you guys. Can you guys hear the sad piano music in the background? Real cozy hours, that's right. Dear Depression Chamber, my name is OBS, and I made a horrible mistake. And my favorite streamer, Monkey Jones, lashed out at me. Can you even imagine what it's like when Sheepover drops a plate or makes the wrong chicken nuggets? If that's the way I behave towards a computer software program. <laughs> Man band, thank you for subscribing. <laughs> this sheep says it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to my story. This might be our last chance. Well, that makes me want to skip your story to keep your uh, dumb ass alive. My audio's a little quiet. My audio's turned up all the way. Hmm. There's no way to turn up my volume. It's already up all the way. Unless sheep over fucked with it while I was out of town. Wait, do you want me to turn up the microphone audio or the music audio? You gotta be a little more specific with this one. And as soon as we get that cleared up, we're gonna start depression chambering. My voice is quiet. Okay! Okay, did that make it any louder at all? At all? Does it sound like shit now? Is the gain all fucked up? I need Sean, the audio engineer, to do this all for me. I'm just the on-screen talent, folks. I can't be expected to understand all these technical conundrums. Sounds fine now. Thank fucking God. I was about to finally have a depression chamber that ends in a suicide. Slightly louder, that's all we wanted, baby. 
<laughs> That's all we wanted. All right, folks, here we go. All the, the, the real show is beginning now. All of that was it was an act. I was pretending to be incompetent. But we're back, baby. The depression chamber is back. And better than ever. It's a show where you, the sad boys at home, email me your saddest stories, your experiences with depression, etc., etc. And I sit here and read them, and we all wallow in sadness together. Some come to the depression chamber to point and laugh at those less fortunate than themselves, to make themselves feel better about their own lives. These are sick, twisted individuals who get their jollies off of our sadness, whereas others come to the chamber because they too carry a great sorrow in their heart. And perhaps it helps to hear similar stories from people in similar situations. And others still come because they masturbate to the sound of Monkey's supple voice. Can a voice even be supple? We don't know! Let's get started. <laughs> Let's get started. All right. This first one comes from Nolan, who titles the email, My Depression Update After Two Years. Hello, Mumkey. I've been following you for a long time now. I saw the Depression Chamber live stream, and in it, you mentioned that some of the oldest ones are two years old now, and those people probably aren't around. Uh, <laughs> I meant uh, probably not still watching. Not that they're dead, but I think either one could be true. Well, guess what? Beep is beep is beep is. I made you say beep. Thank you, Suck Habit. Well, guess what? I still am. I wrote you an email a long time ago for Depression Chamber number two, but you didn't read it. Anyway, I guess I'm here to give you an update on my life. I'm 16 years old, making me only 14 when I started watching you. My mental state has become significantly worse since my original email. However, I'm starting to think that being edgy is simply part of being a teenager. You see, when I was younger, I was confident that I'd be able to avoid it because I knew going into puberty and all that, being edgy was a stereotype. Even now, while writing this, I'm able to consciously point out that it is and I'm not blinded by it or going through any type of phase. Plus, my generation had Filthy Frank and those other edgy content creators to show us the way and get us into that type of humor from the get-go. I think that helped with my generation not being as emo as previous ones. It's weird being in my generation. We're too young to be millennials, but too old to like Fortnite and all that stuff. It's a weird late 2000s, early 2010s time thing, I guess. I actually feel bad for those kids born after me because they're going to grow up in a world without a Filthy Frank and without a Monkey Jones because of YouTube. But anyway, I digress. Two years ago, I told you that I feel like a poison to people. That I make friends and then over the course of many months, they start to connect with me less and less. I don't believe that I ever actually act any differently from beginning to end unless they tell me to stop doing something in which I stop doing it. I think the problem is that people just get tired of me or something. Like they see me when we meet and think I'm one of those wacky guys, but then as the months go on, perhaps they realize that I'm not really putting on an act and that I'm really just a crazy guy. I've been using 4chan since I was 12 years old. I regret that life decision, but at the same time, I don't. It's complicated. I really do wish I could have grown up without it and just been a normal... Uh, F-slur. You can ask Quentin Reviews what that F-slur might be. The problem is I'm ugly and fat, and I was before I even found the website, so I don't think that would have fixed anything. I would have still been ugly and fat, and when you're ugly and fat, you can't be a normal F-slur. I guess I should go back to where my life is right now. After the last... I guess I should get back to where my life is right now. After that last friend group that I wrote to you about two years ago, 
I had almost instantly found another, mostly because I'd already had a friend separate from them that introduced me to all of his friends. This really helped me, and I'm eternally grateful for his friendship. The point is, he isn't my friend anymore. He stopped being my friend about two or so weeks ago now, and I still think about him all the time, every day, no homo. He said he was fed up with how I act, and proceeded to unfriend me on everything and stop talking to me in school. Two years of friendship flushed down the drain. Oh well, I guess. I don't really know what to do or how to make friends. I've never really had to make friends. Most people just sort of start talking to me first and then network me to other people. I've only ever introduced myself to someone once, and that was when I was only five years old. I'm just waiting to be an adult so I can leave the place I'm at and start a new life. I want to be a teacher like Ebitch. It's only two or more years away, so really it's not that far. I really hate teenagers who think they're adults. I don't know why. I just hate when children act like they're at the same level as their parents. And I especially hate it when they think they're better than their parents. And I really hate it when their fucking parents accept that they're better than them and kiss their fucking feet. That's no way to raise a child, you retards. That was in all caps. Anyway, I don't know why I went on that little tangent. How about this? I'm not good with women. I watch your videos, so I'm surprised as to how this happens. I thought I'd be a supreme gentleman by now. I mean, I have female friends who I talk to, and I even tried asking one out once, but she kind of friend-zoned me. I don't really care about that, though. Plus, it's not like she wanted to be with someone else since she's still single and plans to keep it that way, and we're still friends. Also, the friend zone isn't even real. She probably just isn't interested in me romantically, or else she would have said yes. I don't understand why people think it works any other way. If you like each other, she'll say yes, retards. I'm sure you can tell by now that I'm very opinionated and like to argue with people. I take my red pill every morning. That's probably another reason it's hard for me to meet people. Most teenagers blindly hate Republicans because of the news. Even though the Democrats are historically, and still to this day, far worse people. Fucking hell, get back to the point. Okay, okay, okay. So to make a long story short, my depression is worse now than it was before. I'm 16 years old and want to be an adult so that I can start a new life as a teacher and try again from scratch. I'm not good with women and probably never will be. I'm a Republican, I'm a Republican in a liberal bunch, making me an outcast automatically. All in all, my life isn't bad materially. I definitely have it better than others in the way of material goods and standard of living, but my mental state and personality make it horrible for me. Sorry that this has been rambling a bunch, I guess I just wanted to get my story out to you and listen to you read it to me. I'll be in the stream most likely, but won't write anything indicating that it's me because I don't want the potential of people finding me out. Thank you for the content, Mumkey. I've followed you for two years, and I'll follow you for two more, and then some. And that's the end of that email. First thought that comes to mind for Mr. Nolan here. I would say, if you are a staunchly Republican 4chan user, and you're going to go to school to become a teacher, don't expect your depression to get any better in the next six years. Those four years you spend in college, if you think you're lonely now in high school, and you're going to college in a liberal dominated field like teaching, where 70% of your peers are going to be uh, blue haired females, don't expect things to get any better before they get much worse. And that's coming from a guy who also was a, an avid 4chan user at a liberal arts college going into teaching who voted for Donald Trump. That's coming from me. This is not me judging you. This is me speaking from having the exact same experience. <laughs> so, boy, howdy. Look forward to those four years. Look forward. <laughs> Have fun. Yeah, I said females. 
I was listening to Wings of Redemption last night, and that's what he kept saying, and it stuck in my head. <laughs> All right, we need to turn off the sound effect for subscriptions because it keeps interrupting. Uh, da, 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 do, do, do. How do you change things on the thing? Uh, Hagrid Ruby, thank you for subscribing. Okay, let's see if it turns off the sound effect. It'll probably not work, because OBS sucks. More dick than my gay uncle. But what are you going to do? NASA Trex, thank you for subscribing. Let's go to the next story. Hi, Mumkey. I'd appreciate it if you kept this anonymous. Thanks. Folks, if you want to ensure your anonymity, you don't have to email me from your actual email account. You can do a 10-second or what the one of those 10-minute mail things where it automatically destructs. You can just put any name you want. You can put JumpkeyFan6998, <laughs> and you can shoot me the email. No risk. Plenty of reward. The best... Gamble you'll ever make. Anyway. Yeah, Nasa Trex, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm mentally retarded in some way or legitimately depressed. I don't feel depressed, but I don't feel happy either. But I do feel something, and I don't know what. It all strives from these weird, uh, from these bizarre and unwarranted suicidal thoughts I have. Anytime there is a minor inconvenience in my life, such as my laptop running slow, a video game lagging, or me failing to understand something on my university course the first time around, I get the thoughts of, well, maybe I should just kill myself. It started off ironic and jokey to match my edgy humor, but it has slowly become more real to the point I think of ways I could legitimately kill myself in that moment. It's now to the point where I daydream or romanticize the idea that I get diagnosed with some horrible disease like cancer or some shit, so I can just die without, without having to put any effort into it uh, about how to do it. It all strives from this crushing boredom I suffer. No matter what I'm doing, I feel bored. Nothing satisfies me. There's a reason people consider places like high-security prisons to be bad. Because although you get fed three times a day, there's either literally nothing to fucking do or you're on the same routine every day for years that's what my life feels like right now a straight line of fucking nothing and there is no reason for it if you read this thanks for reading monkey couldn't be asked to proofread this shit so hope you got it through okay and thanks for always making good content sent in on valentine's day wonder what could have happened on that day to prompt <laughs> oh, these, these suicidal thoughts. Yeah, that's all. Not, it's not a long one. It's not a long one. Hopefully Mr. Anonymous has not heard that before! Not a long one. Yeah, I'd say if you have chronic boredom in every facet of life, that is a distinct symptom of depression. I, I don't think uh, non-depressed people are always bored. But one, one thing that uh, stuck out to me was that you were having private, um, unwarranted suicidal thoughts, but you described that as starting off ironic and jokey. <laughs> as if one could be ironic and jokey with oneself. I don't know, dude. Do you, do you often, people at home, do you often <laughs> joke in your own mind about that sort of thing? I maybe I'm crazy. Uh, seems like that sort of joke, like, I want to fucking kill myself, that's more of a social joke you would make with friends or on the internet. When you're just thinking that to yourself, is, is that really much of a joke? I don't know. I mean, I come up with jokes in my brain, but I, I don't have inside jokes with myself as if there are two of me in here and we're laughing with each other. I don't know. You're a telltale character. Yeah. Yeah, w when you're just thinking it to yourself, 
and it becomes this pattern. Yeah, I can see how you would stop interpreting it as an inside joke that is literally inside your own brain. It's a good way to poison your own brain. You might have uh, joked yourself into convincing your brain that you're actually depressed. Or maybe you were suicidal from the very beginning and just hoped and prayed it was an inside joke. I'm the only one who appreciates my extremely hilarious highbrow comedy, so I joke to myself all the time. Are you by any chance a Rick and Morty fan? I got a good feeling. Yeah, schizophrenia for sure. LOL, I want to kill myself, LMAO. Yeah, who is, who is thinking that exact sentence in their brain to themselves? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that all the time, but it's not a fucking joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's called satire, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> satire in his own brain. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Here's one from Rotten Cherry Pie. Hey, Monkey Jones, I want to tell you the sad and pathetic things that have happened in my life recently. First of all, I live in a care home. I've, I have been in the care system since 2015, and this is my fifth care home. It fucking sucks. The staff here fucking hate me, and it is extremely obvious. Even the ones who try to be nice to me obviously have trouble tolerating me, since I am so short-tempered, stubborn, and lazy. I skip school a lot, and I have no friends. Basically, yesterday I sat down reading a book at break, and this kid started shouting, claiming I was staring at him. I wasn't. I fed up with the noise and told him I wasn't staring at him, and he should shut the fuck up. That started a whole ass argument, and insults were thrown. Eventually, another kid in my class joined in. Fat fuck, the kid who started the argument, obviously not his real name, said, Nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. That kind of got to me since it was true. I've only been here for two months, and already people make fun of me and start arguments with me. Everywhere I go, I can do nothing without being hated. I turned to the teachers, who this whole time were trying to convince me to leave the room, and demanded that they call home. They said that's not possible. Then this other kid, Neanderthal, or Neanderthal, how do we want to pronounce that? I don't know. Told me I'd have to get in trouble, like smashing something. In the next second, I grabbed the computer on the teacher's desk and threw it onto the ground and stomped on it until it was beyond... A broken beyond repair. I was led out of the classroom. Fuckface had left the room shortly before, asking how my dead brother was to fuck with me. And I sat in the food tech room. Amazingly, the teachers let me on the computer in there. And your website actually isn't fucking blocked. Even though YouTube is blocked. Which is good. Fuck YouTube. Anyway, I left and I spent the afternoon at home binging on drunk junk food and scrolling through thinspiration sites because I'm that fucking sad. Honestly, I hate my body so fucking much. After wasting my life watching random YouTube videos, I ended up cutting myself with the last cleanish blade I had. All over my legs and on my arms too. I deserve it for being so pathetic. I'm currently taking 20 milligrams of Prozac for depressive symptoms evidently <laughs> we should up that <laughs> we should up those milligrams buddy and i guess my body built a tolerance already that quick only four months and i'm empty as fuck i hope i don't start randomly crying again filled with such indescribable pain that i give myself a fucking headache and can't get the fuck out of bed as i just can't bring myself to care about anything Oh, I should probably tell you about last year when I fucking tried to hang myself with a Nintendo DS charger. It was fucking long and it would have worked the hang if I wasn't so damn hesitant. But I won't. The point is, I'm sad and lonely and empty and want to fucking die. And nobody can help me. I will keep watching your videos though because I know... There are unstable losers like me, and it helps knowing I'm not the only failure. Sorry for this stupid, messy, rambly email, but anyway, thank you. Hectorito in the chat seems to think this is fake. You underestimate the pain a man can feel. 
hanging himself with a Nintendo DS charger. Not even a 3DS. And it's 2019! Suicide does what Nintendo don't. That's right, Destiny. He should have 100,000 milligrams of Prozac. <laughs> that feel when your son hangs himself with the DS you bought him. Yeah, what if he would have stretched out the charger cord, and then if he survives the suicide, he can't even play Pokemon Platinum anymore? Don't do that with the charger. Do that with something that you're okay with not having anymore when you inevitably fail the suicide attempt. <laughs> DS charger would break under human weight. I'm sure you could just wrap it around your throat and tug on it. Or even tie it to like a doorknob so it's only really holding up your head. No, I'm not I'm not a psychiatrist here, Hectorito. <laughs> Definitely not. Go ahead and post ja 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 on the chat. Because that's a good joke. That's why they didn't include charges with the new 3DS. They didn't? What a fucking ripoff. No, I'm not giving anybody ideas. I'm just uh, evaluating his story. Obviously, nobody should uh, go through with any suicide attempts based off of the things we say here. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, you guys ready for this one? I don't think you guys are ready for this one, but we're going to give it a shot. This one is from... Uh, this one is from Quentin, last name withheld. Okay. Whew. My life is such a mess. People are so mean to me. Let's start from the beginning. My name is Quentin, and I was a small boy living in Iowa, and people always thought that I was a girl. Driven by my deep-seated insecurities, I decided that once I was a mature adult, that I would grow a disgusting beard with three pounds of food in it so people know that I am a man and not a soy boy cuck. I run a successful channel, unlike you, you toxic fuck, with over 300,000 subscribers where I review films and give my opinion on politics for some unknown reason. Here's the thing. I fucking hate Trump. He embarrasses me every day. He makes us all look like backwards idiots. And the fact that he got elected probably means that we are all backwards idiots. Uh, he's ruining people's lives. He's making horrible racist decisions, which are probably going to have long lasting repercussions after he is out of office. Overall, I would be a much happier person if we found a way to deport him from every position of power that he has ever had. Oh, sorry, went off on a bit of a tangent there. Anyway, can you believe there are people who critique me for giving my opinion on the fucking internet? What the fuck? I thought people on the internet were so kind and gentle, and now they're making fun of me. And I'm getting death threats? WTF? And when your toxic ass was thrown off YouTube, I decided to fight back. So I made fun of your channel deletion, but I deleted it before it got five likes, guys. Just forgive me. It's not like I have a history of extremely pedantic and vindictive behavior, right? And even when I was handed, handled like a child by Emp and Rusty on the Sodi cast, I still can't get over you, monkey. Your fans have doxxed and harassed me. So you know what I had to do? DM an account on Twitter that's not you and say the F slur like six times because I'm clearly a well-functioning adult. You evil monster! You started this! Re! And you want to know the worst part? 
my wife's son, Jay Kwan, has been hogging the Nintendo Switch and my Legos, so I've just been very stressed lately. Jay Kwan doesn't even look like me, but I have no idea why. And no, I don't rape little girls. <laughs> I only rape infants. Oh! <laughs> Get your facts straight, you special individual. I disavowed transphobia like a true hero does. And people are still mean to me? Why? I guess people don't like it when I block people and talk smack when they can't even reply. <laughs> Shocker, that is. I'm a true hero, for I have the ability to post passive-aggressive tweets while saying that I've moved on, despite the fact that I so clearly haven't. Sorry if I was too much of an F-slur for you. Sincerely, NPC2389. Another touching story of somebody's true struggle with depression. That one really hits hard. He's clearly a big fan, familiar with my work, and it, it sucks that I've impacted him in this way. This guy sounds like an absolute cuck. I don't know. I don't know. He sounds like, uh, I mean, it's not, he has a wife and a son. How could he be a cuck? I'm sure Jay Kwan is his. Hey, Mumkey, I know it's weird, but you look really good. No homo. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, 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 thanks for letting me know it's weird to think that. <laughs> okay. Why did this guy send me a Word document? I can't click on that. Ooh, okay. This guy goes into great detail about his failed female relationships. This is our favorite type of depression chamber story. I heard Quentin wanted to vote for Bernie, but his wife's boyfriend forced him to vote for Hillary. Oh, ho, 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 ho. here we go. Hey, Mumkey was watching your third Depression Chamber live stream and saw how entertained you were by the confession story. So here's mine. Not sure if you'll read this or if you're even doing Depression Chamber anymore. Uh, so I need to fix the bits in a bit. I don't know why it's so tiny still. You're even doing Depression Chamber anymore, but I think it would help to get some shit off my chest. All names have been changed for obvious reasons. Thank you for the bits. I'm going to try to do that now, just so that people don't get ripped off. I don't know why. I have the, the font size really big. How could this be? Could it be OBS still sucks dick? Could that be? Won't let me go bigger than 12. Come on! <laughs> Why? This is absurd. Okay. Why won't you go bigger than size 12? <laughs> it just refuses to move. More thrilling, thrilling live stream content. There we go. 44. <laughs> Let's do size 44 to make up for the small ones. <laughs> okay. 12 is big enough, you size queen. I don't think so. I'll mostly be confessing tales of sexual deviancy, as well as me generally being a stupid... or being a fucking sped during my teen years. Hey, there you go. Some of this gets pretty fucked up and gross, so your more sensitive viewers might not like to hear this. Ooh, neither, neither might the Twitch mods, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but if Wings of Redemption can talk about eating out a fat girl's pussy, I think we could read anything we want. Anyway, my downward spiral began in my sophomore year of high school. Rainbows Ashley. <laughs> yeah, that's right, fuck Ashley. <laughs> Who could forget? All right, how do we turn down that sound volume? That's way too fucking loud. <laughs> Whatever. <sighs> anyway, my downward spiral began in my sophomore year of high school. I left my old private Catholic middle school due to the teachers being borderline abusive to me and most of their students. 
So I was a very quiet kid. At the beginning of 10th grade, my friend's sister came to school. Her name was Jennifer. She was also a raging lesbian. Buzz cut septum piercing. What? Do I, what's a septum piercing? <laughs> it's not coming to mind. Am I missing something? We hit it off pretty well at the beginning of the year, but we quickly grew apart due to me being an edgy motherfucker and her being the typical SJW type. Oh, it's a belly button ring. No, it's a nose ring. You guys need to figure this shit out. Okay, nose ring. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like a raging lesbian. Jennifer. About halfway through the year, we went on a week-long retreat to a scout camp up north. This place was pivotal in what marked what I think to be the turning point of me as an adolescent. It was around 9 o'clock at night, and we decided to play sardines, basically hide-and-seek with multiple people. For some reason, she decided to team up with me to hide, which came as a shock to me. We hid under some bushes in the woods, and she wanted to spoon with me to hide better. Keep in mind, she's a lesbian. After a long time of laying there in the dirt, she really started... Or she started really pouring out out all her feelings. She talked to me about her parents' divorce, her daddy issues, and how much she hates her brother, a friend of mine. All I could do through all of this was try to console her by being an autist. Oh, Jennifer, I'm sorry. All the disingenuous shit like that. I started petting her head while we were talking. I don't know why I did it. She asked me why the hell I was petting her, and all I could say was, um, I don't know. This is the closest I ever- I had ever- This was the closest I had ever to a girl, and I was raging hard. Maybe she felt it or something, because she decided we should go see what everyone else did. After a while, we came out of the woods, and everyone gave up looking for us. She avoided me for the rest of the year. <laughs> About a month afterwards, I had my first experience with drugs. It was 420. Ooh. I was with my friend Owen and smoked at least two grams of pot before popping around six Xanax bars. I texted Jennifer that I loved her and fell asleep. <laughs> when she asked what the fuck I was thinking, I told her I was on Xanax and she left it at that. Lillian. Oh, God, okay. My friend Nial, Jennifer's brother. If you're making up fake names, why would you make up Nial? It's not even a name. Decided to invite me over to his dad's house for Halloween. I went to hang out with him, but I found out he had another sister, Lillian. Oh my god! It didn't work with Jennifer, so he's going for Jennifer's little sister, folks. That's the way to do it. No, Nial's not a name, Skumkey. Shut up. It's not a fucking name. It's made up. Anyway. I went over to hang out with him and found out he had another sister, Lillian, and she wanted to talk to me a lot since we were around the same age. I was 15 and she was almost 14. Almost 14. Uh, okay. She dyed my hair while I was over at her house and we got along pretty well. She was pretty hot. Short brown hair, cute face, very large breasts for her age. What is this, the netting game song from the insane clown posse? Yo, for only 13, she got some big tits. After that, your dad'll try to jump again. Only this time, I'll put the 40 to his chin. Can I just do the whole netting game right now? Do I dare? Do I dare do the whole netting game? It's a good ICP song. Look it up. It's also known as Dating Game. Unofficially on YouTube. Uh, let's see. What's the funny part? Uh. While your mom does the dishes and the silverware, I dry fuck her till I nut in my underwear. Good stuff. Good stuff. Only ICP song I've ever heard in my fucking life other than the Magnets one. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Magnets. How do they work? Okay. Very large breasts for her age and a surprisingly curvy body. Oof. Ooh, Uncle Alex, calm down. I went home 
A bit after she dyed my hair and masturbated to the thought of her watching me shower. Okay, ew, that, that's your fantasy is her watching you shower? She asked me to add her on Snapchat while I was over, and I had mostly forgotten about it until she messaged me asking if I wanted to talk. We talked for a while, she seemed like a very sweet girl, but as I would learn later on, she was a fucking hellspawn sent to torture me for what I did to her sister. She asked me if I wanted to be her boyfriend. I'd never had a girlfriend before, and the thought excited me so much that I immediately said yes. Our sexting encounters were boring for the first one or two times until she revealed more of her fetishes to me. Before this, I had only really been interested in the weird stuff you'd find on Tumblr or Rule 34. Expansion, weight gain, etc. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but this little bitch had some real kinks. At 13? What the fuck? The internet should be abolished. For those... Under 15. If you are under 15, you should not be allowed on the internet. I'm saying that would fix YouTube. It would fix the pedo problem on YouTube. Unfortunately, I would lose half of my fan base, but that's a it's a calculated risk I'm willing to take for the sake of humanity in the future. These are problems that we can solve, folks. Anyway, where did I leave off? Under 40? No, no, I don't know. Under 25? Come on, come on. At least 18 is the absolute max. Imagine the internet. It would be nothing but porn. Uh, this little bitch had some real kinks. She talked about how she'd love to be my mommy and make me suck on her tits. I don't know if I'm legally allowed to read this. Uh, and all that, so we decided that the next time I went to hang out with her brother, we'd sneak into the bathroom and fuck around. This was my first sexual experience with a girl, and I longed to feel the pure rush of adrenaline I felt during those five minutes. While my friend played Bloodborne in the other room, I'd grab her tits. Uh, I don't need to go into all this detail. La da da, she'd do the thing, and touch, and touch. Here's the best way I can describe it. It was a literal flash of colors, orange to red to blue. It's like my head was falling off. Another one of my most fond sexual memories was... <laughs> uh, yeah, something in the kitchen while her sister Jennifer sat in the other room watching TV or when I fucked her under the blankets right next to Jennifer. How does Jennifer not know what's going on? I'll skip to the really fucked parts. I blame Lillian for how fucking skewed my sexual preferences are. They're irredeemable. It all started when she told me how turned on she was by the human centipede. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I asked her what exactly turned her on about it, and she'd talk about wanting to force people to do whatever she said and how much she loved the <laughs> idea of forcing them into depraved animal-like states. We began sexting more and more and more. She'd tell me about her darkest fantasies, how much she wanted to watch me piss, how much she wanted me to piss inside of her, how much she wanted to drink my piss, wanted me to drink her piss, eat her dirty ass, oh, etc. None of this was off-putting to me based purely on the fact that I hadn't had any prior sexual experiences. She'd write paragraphs about stories of her pretending to be a surgeon and cutting me until I died, wanting to eat my cock after she sliced it off, <laughs> fucking my intestines. She, lived, she loved the idea of getting fucked by dogs. Goddamn furries. We can't escape them on this show. It was something with her and animals. She also loved the idea of killing dogs and making me fuck their mouths or their eye sockets. These writings are where I subconsciously drew the line. I really drew the line when she wrote a paragraph about how she wanted me to fuck my dog in the ass. I love my dog with all my heart and writing that paragraph made me cry. <laughs> Maybe she wants to do a threesome with Shane Dawson! A 
About a week after this and a month after dating, I decided to end it. It was too much. Epilogue. It's been a while since these experiences and many girls have came and went. The summer after my sophomore year, my best friend of the time, Owen, got sent to rehab. My mom found all my weed and cigarettes. She found screenshots of pictures, videos, and convos with Lillian I had kept in the wank bank on my phone. I was already incredibly depressed over the summer, although I was on multiple antidepressants, and the combination of all these things drove me to throw myself off the roof of my house into my backyard, about three stories tall. I don't know how I came to this decision, months of frying my brain with all the fucked up drugs I was using, Panda, Xanax, Adderall, Lean, shit tons of weed. Or maybe I threw myself off the roof despite my mom. Either way, I wasn't too affected by my so-called suicide attempt. And neither were my parents. Life went on as normal. Anyway, Mumkey, thank you for reading this. I'm doing much better now. No more drugs, no more antidepressants, which can fuck your life up if you're not careful. And I have a supportive girlfriend. It's been a while since these events, and I've made changes in my life for the better. Thanks again, L. <laughs> I didn't kitten my cat! I didn't flowers on my cat! I didn't put my joyful anywhere near my cat! <laughs> I really, nine-tailed cat, this, uh, this bestiality story was your favorite one so far? Nine-tailed cat! Okay. Uh, so beautiful, we begin. I have dyslexia, so if you see any words that don't make sense, sorry. So, from when I was born, my parents hated each other, and they'd been apart for as long as I remember. Then there was a time in kindergarten where my parents had to help some. When I was eight, I meet this girl who was my aunt, friend's kid, and she was very nice. This is all one sentence, by the way. She was very nice. We had so much in common that we grow for two years, then fifth grade happened. We stopped talking because she went to a different school then. I did then in sixth grade. A different aunt passed away for overdosing, and my mom had a friend who fucked us over and took our stuff. And also, I meet that old friend of mine. We talked on 4th of July and never saw her since. Then, I liked this girl in seventh grade, and I went full stacker on her. Creepy then at the start of seventh grade. I meet this other girl who was sweet, beautiful, very nice. Then we started talk, and I had a huge crush on her. And drunning that summer, I would not stop dreaming of her. And cake the beginning of eighth grade, where I liked her. And she found out, and she had a boyfriend who was a asshole and hated me. It was a good girl, bad guy thing. He wanted me dead, and I knew it, but I was just a nerd who watches YouTube all day. And it was, and her was a jock who could throw me across the football field so yeah I was fucked and I had to stay away from her or I would become a football and it sucked tell she broke up with him by then I found out my friend also liked her I wanted to ask her out for so long but I didn't want to be a asshole to my friend then the last day of eighth grade and I was going to ask her out we went on a last day trip and I was sitting next to her and talked uh, about to ask her she uh, fell feel asleep and she hit me and summer began with my grandpa dying and it sucked a man who was always trying to help me pass away and just like that sucked then my freshman year which is still happening anyway so I meet this new girl we liked a lot of the same anime and yeah then we dated and looking back on it I should have left that relationship earlier but I didn't and it was a bad one then we broke up she left me for a noter girl, and yeah, so I remember the girl from 8th grade, we started talking, and the friend that also has a crush on her still liked her, and what you're about to hear was the last three days on Friday night, I told her, I told I her I liked her, 
Last night, I told my friend he is very mad and won't talk to me and makes fun of my autism <laughs> in the process of being pissed. Then I asked her out, and just like that, my heart broke in somewhere I liked... Someone I liked for two years except for that crazy girlfriend just saying no broke me and I remember why I hate myself. I'm no good thing on this world within seven mounts of losing a very important person. My mom going to the hospital, my dad losing his car and a fucking psychopathic girlfriend. Than having the most important person in life likening someone else and I just had a mental breakdown and I remember I'm just a piece of shit. This one is like 10 fucking pages long. Holy shit. Holy shit. 24 hour depression chamber. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go take a quick pee and we'll read this 30 year story. BRB fam. Oh, BRB. Oh, BRB. Oh, BRB. Oh, BRB. Oh, we're back very briefly before we go into this giant story I want to give you all a few monkey updates I know you've been waiting for a lot of things and they're coming let me say first the monkey box 2 the next big 45 minute scripted monkey I want you to turn me into a football and shove me up Stacy's supple bottom thank you baby I love you too baby <laughs> Uh, uh, dance magic, dance, dance, uh, baby. Anyway, the new Monkey Box video, the long awaited sequel, the continuation of me reviewing every monkey movie ever made, will be out by the end of this month, folks. God, I hope it is. I hope it is. Also, I owe you all another 24 hour stream because you hit the donation goal on the previous one. And right now, I'm planning on doing that Saturday, March 30th at noon Eastern Time for 24 hours. We're not watching Brad Dassey again, although I imagine we might dedicate perhaps an hour to Brad Dassey. But during this big stream, we could do a Depression Chamber. We can do uh, gaming. Going to have Florian on. Erich will come on at some point. Uh, I'm going to try to get you know, Dale Gribble, Rusty, Cage... So we'll have a whole bunch of segments. It won't just be listening to the same song on repeat for 24 hours like the last one was. This one should be more fun. And finally, I'm trying to stream more often now. I This is like my first stream in a week. So 
I'm not gonna go every single night, but I'm going to try my best to do so. And I think tomorrow night's stream, I wanna get political, folks. We've had a lot of Democrats jump into the 2020 campaign. You got Beto O'Rourke, you've got the Yang Gang, of course, Bernie, uh, uh, Cory Booker, all of these fucking people. Most of them, I have no idea who they are or what they represent. So I'm going to go to that uh, Who Do I Side With website where you just you give all your political opinions and then it tells you which candidate you should vote for based off of your opinions. And I thought it'd be fun if there's like an extended version of that. And I think I'm going to fill out every single answer, even on things that I'm completely uninformed about. <laughs> so that, that could take uh, a good hour or two. And whoever... I get as my, you know, who I side with the most, regardless of uh, platform or, or a political party. Whoever it lands on is who I'm going to vote for in, uh, in the upcoming election. I thought it'd be fun. And I thought it would uh, create some rousing discussions with you guys in the chat about some political issues that I genuinely have no opinion on. And maybe you guys could uh, inform me on some of these things and help me form my own opinion. I think it'll be an educational, fun night of politics, folks. I'm not like those other Twitch streamers, too scared to touch politics with a 10-foot pole. I'll say, you know what? You want to hear my opinion on immigration? Let's dive in. Let's do it. I don't care. Yang Gang 2020! Give me my thousand dollars, Yang! Yang Gang, baby! The Yangest of the Gangest! Okay, we've got a very, very long Depression Chamber story, so let's jump into it. Takeaways. New Monkey Box coming up this month. Unless I fuck up. Maybe it'll come out on April Fool's Day. <laughs> 24 hour stream on the 30th. And tomorrow night, we're going full Yang Gang, baby! Gonna fill out some political compass shit. Okay. Yang gang! Hell yeah! You don't want to vote for Trump again? I'm going to vote for whoever the website tells me I agree with. If it's Trump, I'll vote for Trump. If it's Andrew Yang, I'll vote for fucking Yang. Uh, I've had plenty of fun watching Trump's uh, shenanigans the last two and a half years, but... Um, my, my vote is up for grabs. Anybody can earn it. All they have to do is agree with me <laughs> on whatever stupid shit I uh, decide I, uh, how I feel on things. Okay, let's get going. Uh, I need a refill. Fuck. I'll drink this half, uh, half full warm one. Hey, Mumkey. Wasn't sure... If I'll even bother sending this in or whatever, I'll probably leave it in the email drafts tab until you stream the depression chamber next. Either that or I'll just cringe at myself and shred the document. I don't really know if I have even have a shit enough life to deserve a place on your show, but all the people with their obsession stories really got to me, and I felt like I just wanted someone to hear so they might find me relatable or sympathetic since I got that same vibe from watching the last stream from others. I'm 18 now, but since I was like 14, I keep getting obsessed with pretty girls, and each one I get more attached to and invested in, and it ends up worse. I'll probably type this with their real names and then do a find and replace with fake ones at the end, just to keep it easy to write. My level of, of, my level of obsession with attractive girls is such an issue that sometimes I'll just see a cute girl on the street and obsess about her for the rest of the day, and think about how wonderful it would be to marry her and spend the rest of our lives together. Like other people remembered in their stories, I, always, I was always better at being friends with girls. That isn't to say I've never had any male friends, but my closest and best friend I ever had was a girl and probably had the biggest impact on me. Let me guess. He ruins that friendship by developing a crush on her and confesses it to her. Just, that's my guess. Place your guesses in the comment section which, that way? <laughs> yeah, that way. <laughs> da, 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 da. 
Despite this, I haven't had a single friend since primary school, British elementary school. I don't know if I actually have depression, the illness, but my other mental illness has certainly got me fucked and miserable. I have Asperger's syndrome, and my big issue is my total inability to make and maintain friendships, which has been really intense since I was like 10 or 11 years old until now. Surprisingly, this doesn't bother me as much as it does others, and even though I don't have a friend in the world, I don't give a shit because I hate being around nearly everyone, close family not included. Being around people is stressful and disgusting, and I hate every second of it, to the point that if my roommates are in the kitchen socializing, I don't feel safe from them bullying me or trying to physically attack me unless I hold a cooking knife, which can be played off as not insane since I am only ever in the kitchen to cook or eat, and I always put headphones on with a podcast playing so I don't have to talk to anyone. I even started keeping the knife in my room because they started fucking with me, and I want to be able to fend them off if they come to beat the shit out of me. I don't really feel loneliness or the need to socialize, except for when I talk to girls I end up obsessing over. They're the only people I feel any kind of desire to spend time with, mainly because they're nice and I'm not repulsed by their company. I still have no idea how to talk to them, though, which I'll get into. It's probably worth noting that I come off as so creepy to them since they're the only person I ever try to talk to or interact with. Otherwise, I am totally, completely isolated. Some days, the only humans I speak to are people selling shit in the supermarket. And apart from my soul-consuming desire to have a girlfriend, this total lack of human interaction doesn't make me feel bad. So I'll end the boring intro shit and just get into a vague timeline of how I ended up feeling sick and miserable over every pretty girl I come into contact with. The first girl was nothing much, just a girl I had a crush on at 14. I thought she was physically attractive, but when she ended up fucking my bully, I realized what a whore she was, and I got over that fairly easily. It is very telling that even though she was... The one I was least attached to in the story, I still spent a lot of time on this school trip we were on in Europe trying to take pictures of her without being noticed, several of which I still have, not because she's in them, but because I kept the album of holiday pics intact. Anyway, while I was on this trip, I was able to actually spend time around other people. I think the main reason I hadn't latched onto any girls before this time was because I literally never spoke to any that weren't in my class, so I didn't have enough interactions to latch onto them. But spending a week having to socialize with people meant I noticed two different girls as extremely attractive, and just happened to latch onto the first one. I don't know why I liked her so much, since she, since she refused to even take a selfie with me, despite me asking multiple times, which really hurt. I was really severely attracted to her for a shortish period of time, while kinda eyeing up the other girl I saw. I say saw because I never actually spoke to her, just stared at her and thought about how pretty she was. Anyway, this first girl, I was really into her, and after a while, she blocked me on Facebook. I have literally no idea why, and it was probably due to some autist behavior that I didn't even realize I was doing. That's a big gap in the narrative of my story, is that a lot of the ways I upset or even frighten girls was by doing something. I have no idea what it was a lot of the time, since I don't really know how people feel about my actions towards them unless they explain it to me. And I don't know if what I'm doing is off-putting, or that I'm even actively doing anything at all. I have had a lot of serious negative reactions from girls to what I perceived as doing absolutely nothing. I was really shaken by this and even posted on Facebook several times asking if someone is making up rumors about me to get people to block me since I couldn't rationalize what I'd possibly done to make her want to block me. As soon as she soon came to realize that I openly hated her after that. One time I even told her to die right to her face. Fuck her. I was just a retarded 14 year old kid and it all seemed so serious at the time and the emotional impact it had still makes me hate her to this day. After that was done with, it was the natural progression for me to move on to the second girl I'd been eyeing up in Europe. She was so wonderful and attractive and sweet, and she really meant the world to me at the time. When we had our first school prom when we were 14, I think I she asked me to dance, but I was so scared I'd either misheard her, misheard or that she was 
just saying it to make fun of me. I pretended I hadn't heard and walked off. She later then tried to talk to me, to which I just replied, You know, this is my first time... This is the first time you've ever talked to me. I thought that was a funny icebreaker, but she just mumbled something I didn't hear and walked off. I still don't know if that upset her or not. Maybe she did think it was funny. I'll literally never know. I've got a pretty good feeling, bud. Over the course of months... I followed her everywhere like a loyal puppy, always from a distance, and I was too autistic to realize that what I was doing was completely obvious to her and everybody. Every second of playtime, what we call recess in the UK, I would try and stay near to her. She'd often stand next to a radiator and talk with her friends in the school corridor, and I'd keep walking by, <laughs> spend the whole 45-minute lunch break just walking in a circle through the school entrance past her, right through the corridor, out the side entrance, and back to the main entrance, just so I could stare at her pretty, wonderful face for a few precious seconds each time. She was best friends with some ugly girl who I thought looked like a lesbian, and I fucking hate her guts so much. I convinced myself she was a lesbian in trying to steal Emma, my crush, away from me. They were inseparable, which also meant I couldn't ask Emma out without her cunt friend weighing in. To this day, not only do I still hate her friend's stupid know-it-all whore face with all my heart, but I also hate everyone with the same name. To be fair, I hated the name she had before I even met her because it sounds nasty as shit, but this is a recurring thing that I have done multiple times. It applies to the ex-boyfriend of the next girl I'd focus my obsession on. Everyone who has the same name as him, I instantly take a disliking to. And have written off listening to the content of certain internet personalities who I'd probably have enjoyed simply for having the same name as him. But yeah, I hated her best friend with all my heart. One time, my parents were picking me up from school and they saw that girl drop a kid's drawing, which could have had an emotional importance to her, I hope so, and were going to give it back to her. I convinced them to let me have it so I could tear it up or just make sure she didn't get it as petty revenge. I ended up leaving it in a wet car park. I didn't rip it, but there's no way she ever got it back either. Well, I know that's kind of... That's a kind of boring anecdote. Oh, it's not boring. It, it's more fascinating than you could ever possibly imagine. We're learning a lot about your psyche at the time. It gets across the point of how much I was bothered by her, simply for being friends with a girl I liked. As I stared... Uh, to generally... As I started, I assume he meant... As I started to generally step up my creepiness, Emma's friends would walk up to me and tell me to my face to stop stalking her and to leave her alone. Of course, I'd poorly feign ignorance and pretend I hadn't been looking at her at all. I also managed to convince myself she hadn't actually noticed and that they were just going behind her back to yell at me, despite the fact this all happened right in front of her. To be fair, I did follow her right down the street from the school every single day, but that was where the car park was, and I had to go that way anyway. But I did hang back, leaving the school so I could always be behind her, just so I could gaze longingly at her pretty blonde hair. After a while, teachers who worked with the kids' issues started telling me to leave her alone, but I think I actually did... I think I did actually manage to convince them she was just paranoid and that I wasn't doing any such thing. Teachers are more willing to believe you with shit like that, I've noticed. At one point, she unfriended me on Facebook. This hurt me more than I can describe, and I simply messaged her the word, why. I didn't get a response. Not even a red. So I went back with, why, in all caps. <laughs> Again, nothing. Every few days, I'd send her longer and longer speeches, apologizing for whatever I did to make her unfriend me. She never even opened them. It occurs to me now that since we weren't friends, those messages would have been put and filtered, and she'd have never even seen them. <laughs> I deleted my copies of those messages out of shame, so I can't see what I wrote, but she would still have them. 
<laughs> and if she ever checks her filter to this day, she'll see my pathetic begging 14-year-old rants, apologizing for upsetting her somehow. I later realized she deleted like 40 friends and was just cleaning up people she didn't know too well. And I felt like a real retard. Again, more evidence. Everybody under the age of 18 should be banned from the internet outright. You can't have these embarrassing uh, memories and regrets if you were never allowed on the internet in the first place. Ban them! Or, oh, bruv, you got a, an internet license? That'll be 18, bruv. 18 to go on the internet, internet, bruv. The internet, bruv. That's how they talk over there. Oh, bruv. Oh, bruv, it's your boy. You need a license to go on the internet, bruv. Okay. Eventually, the only real way I moved past her was finding a new girl to target with my affections. Since I was around 14, there hasn't been a single moment where I wasn't totally in love with some girl or other. This new girl, Laura, was just overall much nicer to me. Once even referred to me as her friend, which felt like the most wonderful thing in the world to me. And I just generally latched onto her to a stronger degree. This is a girl I would spend the next three or more years viewing as my entire world. I can admit that even now, as we live in separate cities and I'll literally never see her again, I still love her more than literally anyone and would choose to be with her more than any woman alive. Just to give you a measure for my autism level. When I first initially met this girl, I didn't like her for two reasons. First of all, she was from the other middle school, and I had decided I hated everyone who went to that school for some reason. Despite thinking she was attractive, I initially blocked her on Facebook just for this. The other reason was that she had a similar name to a character from a book I was reading at the time, and that character was a bitch at the part of the story I was up to. I nearly confronted her once about f hurting the feelings of the character I liked, which would have been fucking weird and embarrassing. I even got it in my mouth ready to say, but didn't get the chance. Maybe if I had, maybe if I had, I could have saved many years of misery, but it would have just been some other girl if not her. She was wonderful, and I love her. While it's really weird, when I first admitted to myself I loved her, I got an erection just from that, not even thinking about her looks, just about how nice she was to me. Remember, this was just distant basic friendliness, but I wasn't used to that since nearly everyone treated me like shit. I also had masturbated over the thought of her the first week we met, which shows how attractive she was, to me at least before I even romantically set my sights on her. I was a bit smarter about following her around everywhere this time, and although some of her friends did notice, it wasn't as intense as I had done it before. I did consider hating her best friend, since that was just kind of what I'd done the time before, but then I decided it wasn't productive and gave up on that idea. It's hard to really condense the whole three to four year experience down to just a few paragraphs, but I'll just go through some of the main things that stick out to me. So much of the time, I was just desperate to ask her to go with me, to go out with me, so deeply desperate. I, rem I remember one lesson, it was right before the end of the year, and she was sat next to me for group work we were put to doing. And we talked and it was nice. I was so close to asking her, but I pussied out. It was after the summer break that I actually did it. I got to the point where I felt sick all the time. I couldn't bring myself to eat because I was so hopelessly desperate for her. I told myself I'd jump off a bridge if she didn't say yes. I don't know how serious I was to myself about it at the time, but I did a lot of bravado posturing to myself about how I'd kill myself or threaten to kill myself if she didn't go out with me. Since I'm writing this, you'll know I didn't follow through. I asked her out after following her all the way across the school. Her friend was with her, which wasn't ideal, but it was the only chance. At least I saw it as my only chance because one science lesson she wasn't there for. Her friends had convinced this guy who sat with us to ask her out in the next lesson. He was a fuckboy and wouldn't have treated her right, went out with a lot of girls. 
He was also a pathological liar and told us all his dad was black and owned a million dollar yacht and that his dad hired a bunch of boat prostitutes to live on it. In summer, he's go out on the boat and him and his dad would order any of prostitutes to have sex with them and the girls would just do it. He was white, by the way, which made the black dad lie more retarded. He also told us his dad had turned gay and left his mom, which, all of which was bullshit. We knew his dad and none of this was true. Anyway, this guy was going to ask her out, I thought, which forced me to do it first. I don't know if he was actually going to, but after hearing that she just rejected me, he didn't bother doing it. I went up to her and asked her to go out with me. She told me no. It was such a pathetic moment. I literally collapsed and fell to my knees in total dejected misery. I just, oh no. I just looked at her and said, please, please, hoping that would work. No again! I asked why and she gave me some hopeful excuses about not knowing me well enough and not wanting a boyfriend right now. And she walked off. If she hadn't said those things, I might have moved on. But I told myself, well, I can uh, get to know her better and she'll want a boyfriend sometime, right? After she rejected me, I half planned to walk to the bridge I was going to jump off but somehow didn't I thought about running out of the school and just going somewhere just walking off but I, I decided to just go to lessons I literally had the next lesson with her and as I walked I was amazed at myself that I actually wasn't going to kill myself what was I doing I was telling myself to move on, but over the course of the lesson, I managed to tell myself that she did love me, really. I just had to be persistent, and she'd love me eventually. She walked past me, and her arm kind of brushed me, and I knew for sure we were meant to be together. And that she did love me. During this time, a really cute girl asked me out, although I don't know how serious she was. I actually turned her down, not because I didn't find her attractive, because I did, but just because I only wanted Laura. There was another time another girl asked me out, but she was just a fat slut. Not an insult, she was fat and slept around. That is an honest description of her. So I rejected her too. I can't really remember how much longer after that it was, but soonish we were moved to a new science room. They taught the three different sciences, sciences on a schedule throughout the year. The seating plan was handed out. We were told just what table to sit on. Laura wasn't even there that lesson, and luckily she was put on my table. It was lucky that the two other kids sat side by side, leaving an empty space. She has to sit next to me. It was in this lesson I'd go on to do some of the creepiest and cringiest things of my teen years. While I could always see well, it was getting to the point where I would actually need glasses soon. She had glasses and one time she let me try them on and it genuinely made things a lot clearer. That led me to a really cringeworthy moment where I couldn't see what was on the board so I asked her, could I borrow your glasses? It seemed fine to me at the time, but looking back, I went to vomit thinking about how awkward that was. Now, that, that one's not that bad. Seems like a standard request. Another time, I had some money in my pocket. It was only a penny, but when she wasn't looking, I slipped it into her pocket just so she could have some more money. The worst thing I ever did when she wasn't looking was pick loose hairs off her jacket. I got one and another off the table where she sat on another day. I wanted to have some of her hair because she was just so pretty. I considered eating them, but in the end, I never did. I still have these in a box in my room and I can't bring myself to throw them away. I did put one of them on the tip of my penis once so I could feel like she'd touched my dick. It's weird, but I just wanted it so badly. 
One time in English class, I had missed some lessons and didn't have any notes on the topic. I managed to convince her, with the teacher's input, to let me take her workbook home to copy from. I didn't do anything to it because that's legally sexual assault and because that felt too unfair to do to her. But I did take pictures of every page just to see her cute handwriting. I even... S I even saved pics of her handwriting to the folder of her pics I jack off to just because it was her handwriting and it reminds me of how wonderful she is! He jerked off to her handwriting! <laughs> Oof. Folks, would you be excited if I told you we're not even halfway through? Ooh. When I finally got glasses, I was so happy just because it was some way we could be similar and perhaps we could bond or relate to one another over this. I also started writing a fan fiction about her, realizing she loved me and kissing me and wanting to be with me, but I ended up deleting it out of cringe and shame and thinking that it was somehow demeaning to her. I obsessed over her all this... Uh, all through this time, only speaking to her through awkward, forced conversations whenever I could. She would never attempt to speak to me, just respond when I tried to talk to her. I think out of pity or obligation. I remember one day just sitting in my bedroom, in the dark alone, playing Minecraft, and the overwhelming misery of the situation overwhelmed me. I sat there, hopping through a savanna biome, crying my eyes out, and just asking myself why she wouldn't love me. The time came when we finished our GCSEs. I don't know what the American version of those are, but it's the exams you take when you're 16 to see what sixth form you get into. Ages 11 through 18 is called college here, with 17 to 18 being sixth form college. I don't know how that equates to America. I had asked her which sixth form she was going to go to, so I could go to the same one. The nearest good one like a 30 minutes drive away that's a long drive by UK standards and I wasn't willing to spend an hour a day driving back and forth but the main reason I stayed at the sixth form was that was part of the college I was already at was because she was there too there were other reasons but my main deciding factor was that she was there if she'd gone to the one in the next town I would have followed in a heartbeat a quick tangent from the story that happened at around this time will illustrate just how weird I came across the girls and just how terrifying my clueless autistic behavior seemed to them. These were some random girl, Lexi, who I wasn't even that into. I just thought she was kind of cute. One day we had an enrichment day. Those are days a few times a year where, that they ditch lessons and teach you about how wonderful diversity is all day or how to do household chores or even how to put on condoms and not get AIDS, or tell you how great apprenticeships are and how much the government wants you to get an apprenticeship and why you would want to go to university when you could get an apprenticeship. You get the idea. Once they even gave us five or six lessons in the day about apprenticeships, one about university, despite the fact only four of us in the class of 25 were even considering an apprenticeship. But anyway, for enrichment days, the groups and classes and timetables are mixed up, and I got put in the class with this girl, Lexi. The first lesson I didn't even bother to try because it was sports and exercise shit, and fuck that. I just sat at the side with some other random girl who refused to take part and chatted. Anyway, next lesson, we all enter the classroom, and the only free space is next to Le Lexi, so I sit there, and we talk, and it's kind of fun. We had to go to form, which is basically a 15-minute check that everyone's there at break time and I spoke to her more there then we had the next lesson since we got since we'd got along so well in the last one I naturally sat next to her again once again I thought we were having some a nice time and she seemed really friendly we left that class for the next one and we were walking together and talking she even gave me some hand cream that smelled nice in hindsight perhaps me Perhaps me keep sniffing my hands might have come across 
a little bit strange, but whatever. It was in this lesson that they made us get into a circle of chairs and someone went to put theirs next to her, which I was having none of. I basically shoved them out of the way so I could sit next to Lexi. I thought this was completely uh, surreptitious, surreptitious and that no one would possibly notice and didn't find out until a few days later that everyone noticed. After that, it was lunch, no big deal. So we had the next lesson, the fourth, I'd try and sit next to her in. There was a space right next to her, open, and I even asked, is it okay if I sit here? She mumbled something I couldn't hear and felt stupid asking what it was, so I just sat there anyway. Once again, we were chatting. It seemed nice to me. We had one last lesson, and I was kind of hoping I'd get to sit with her again, but as soon as we left, she immediately gravitated to some guy, who was her future boyfriend, which kind of upset me because I wanted to sit with her again, but no big deal. Well, smallish deal. But that day ended, and it was one of the nicest I'd had for ages. But it turns out, not for her. A day or two later, the pastoral staff, which is like half counselor, half admin team, since you don't get counselors at my school, called me into their office. Apparently, she'd reported me to them for following her to every lesson. I told them that wasn't true. I'd only sat with her for four out of six lessons and that I was just trying to be friendly. They did give in in the end, but it really shook me. I thought we'd had fun. I thought it was nice. They also yelled at me because I'd replied to some of her tweets, which I thought was the point of social media. They also said I'd followed her to places we'd been sent as a class, but I had no choice but to follow her. She did block me on Twitter just for being friendly. Very strangely, when I made fun of her trans friend in front of her months later, she actually unblocked and followed me again, which I thought was strange as fuck, but whatever. Women, huh? They had a second prom for us at 16, because some people were leaving. Most weren't, but a good number were. This was fucking hell for me. I was so desperate to ask Laura to go with me. This was about 10 months after the last time I'd tried, and I really wanted to ask her, but I never did. The whole prom, she was hanging out with her friends, talking to them. They stood around her like a swarm of bees, and I couldn't get to talk to her. I grew more lonely and miserable over the night, and by the second half, all I did was stare at her from across the room longingly, wishing she'd be my girlfriend, and thinking Elliot-like thoughts about all the people who had the chance to talk to her to and be with her instead of me. Of course, I wouldn't and couldn't have acted on any of these thoughts. It's just as realistic as fantasizing about being a supervillain with psychic powers. But still, near the end, I just sat on a bench gazing at her and trying not to cry. Multiple times, I had to go outside and breathe slowly so I wouldn't just start crying in front of everyone. My eyes were wet. As it actually ended and they sent us all home, I actually had a short, awkward conversation with her. She was nice about it, and I don't think she had any clue how much it meant to me. It meant that she was the last person from school I spoke to before the summer break, and, the fact, and that fact alone meant the world to me. Talking to her felt like what I imagined swigging morphine would be like, a, a deep, intense, calming rush, like if adrenaline was warm and fuzzy and wonderful. My parents then picked me up and I got home, curled up in bed, and cried about how much I loved her and how lonely I was. One night I was so angry at the thought that she'd had a boyfriend before, my, my parents overheard me angrily mumbling about how much I wanted to stab him and got concerned I meant them. I downplayed it, but it shows how fucking angry this made me. Again, shit I'd never actually do because I don't want prison, and there's no way I'd be bold enough to actually do it. A lot of the reason I didn't do as much creepy begging as the other people who wrote into this show <laughs> was because I was too much of a pussy to do it, and I wouldn't have done all that and more if I had the guts. Similar to the bleach plan guy, I did have a ton of crazy plans in my head about how to make her love me, but it but was too chicken to do any of them. One idea I had was to go to her house, stab myself, cut my clothing, then claim some monsters with big claws had attacked me. And she and her parents would have to take care of me from my stab wound, and she'd grow to love me while taking care of me. 
This makes only a small amount more sense when you take into consideration she talked a lot about a medical career at the time. Only now do I realize how retarded this sounds, and I'm laughing to myself as I type this, just because of how stupid that plan was. There were many more half-baked moronic ideas like that I can't get into and don't want to remember, but it gives you the picture. It got to the next school year, and I was in sixth form. This was the age where you could finally wear whatever you liked to school rather than uniform. Every school has uniforms in the UK up to either age 16 or 18, depending where you go. I honestly can't remember shit for the next year. It was kind of, it was just kind of a haze of me gazing at Laura, desperately trying everything I could, as far as my autist brain was aware, to make her like me. One thing I did do was start Facebook messaging her more frequently. Always with a school-related issue, I'd create as an excuse to talk to her, and then drag out a forced conversation she'd feel obliged to keep up for half an hour afterwards. I can't tell how much she actually liked doing this, but it was the most wonderful feeling in the world for me to actually talk to her like this, and I enjoyed getting to do so immensely. I would always be happy for the rest of the day whenever I got to do so. One more thing I did at some vague point in this time was I had my parents hire her dad. He did trade work, and when they needed work done on the house, I got them to hire him just so they'd have more money. She'd have more money. I just wanted to help her. Later that year, I saw she went on a family holiday to Germany, and I felt happy that I had personally helped her family be rich enough to manage to afford that. I helped her. It was the final year of sixth form where the f shit really hit the fan with the whole thing. I was getting to the point where I couldn't live with myself if I didn't ask her out. If we dated all year, we'd be close enough for one of us to follow the other to university. Any less and she might want to just end it there. That was my reasoning anyway. I knew I had to do it after class before lunch on a certain day of the week. I'd normally go home after this lesson on this day, and I lied to my grandma for weeks about someone coming in to give advice about careers that day, and repeatedly canceling and postponing to the next week just so I could ask Laura to go out with me, so I wouldn't have to leave before I had the chance. Right at the beginning of the year, I was doing drama. Me and our group started doing a project on Elliot Roger after I suggested it. We wanted a theme of someone doing evil, but giving their side a fair shake and not vilifying them. Some of them suggested some Islamic terrorists we could humanize, but they all loved my suggestion of Elliot when I showed them the Retribution video. This was at a really fateful time for me to look into it. As homework, I started reading the manifesto, and through my research into Elliot, I found your YouTube channel and based shamans, which is probably the best thing to come out of this. It was strange reading the manifesto. I had never really related to anyone that strongly. I wasn't unironically on board with the murdery stuff, of course, and I didn't relate to the woman-hating incel rage thing. I love girls and want to be with one more than anything, but it was just general things. I was taking notes on the manifesto for the class, and every couple of lines I'd write down hashtag relatable or relatable as fuck. It was just little things, things I can't even pick out, just ways he felt, and ways he acted and reacted to stuff. Tiny little anecdotes and stories from his childhood. I felt like I could have written it, like he was remembering things that happened to me. Overall, his life isn't a parallel of mine, it's just little things that I'm sure is linked to Asperger's that we both experienced. I, I still have the document I took the notes on, and scrolling through, moments I found stunningly, upsettingly, deeply relatable were him declaring other children as his sworn enemy as a young child, being better childhood friends with girls, and even remembered having a bath as a young child with his female friend, something very specific that happened to me too. Him remembering acting weird and annoying at school just to have some level of recognition at all, fantasizing about being a dictator and spitting uh, and spiting everyone he didn't like with his power. Just little things like that stuck with me and reminded me exactly of ways I'd behaved and felt before. I don't look up to or idolize Elliot. I pity him and feel sad for him. 
I don't condone his actions, but I do recognize him as a victim of the mental illness of Asperger's, as well as him just being a narcissistic killer. I also did see the obvious laughable comedy in the story and thought he was a massive fucking pussy through many parts, but reading it was a deeply impactful and conflicting experience. It was probably the worst time to be reading the manifesto, spending all day doing so in free periods for research, because this is the time when I finally managed to get enough courage to ask Laura to go out with me. I just ran after her after class and nervously asked her if she wanted to get coffee with me. I don't know how loud I was doing it, but under every single breath I took waiting for a response, I was mumbling, I'm in love with you, I'm in love with you, over and over again. It's possible she heard this, but I really don't think she did. To my utter amazement, she actually said yes! She said she was busy right then, but she would be willing to do so later in the week. I don't think I was ever happier than in that moment. Looking back, I wish I'd died in that instant, or immediately gone and killed myself to spare myself what came next! I went back to my grandma's house since I had no more lessons, and for the first time in my life, when they asked me if I had a nice day at school, I responded with yes. They were so used to, be, used to me saying no. They didn't even hear the yes, and just presumed I'd said no again. I'm glad of this, since I didn't tell them I'd actually got a girl to agree to hang out with me. I was so excited. I knew She knew I liked her. She had to be interested to agree, right? I hope I don't seem like a whiny cunt in this story, but for me, this was all so dramatic. I feel like I don't deserve to feel as bad as I do because of the fucked up lives of other people in these chamber stories, but this was probably the worst moment of my life. I'd say, or at least the worst and most broken I've felt in a single instant. I was repeatedly checking Facebook to see if she'd message me about hanging out sometime. And finally, one came. It was like getting punched in the stomach and getting a shotgun blast to the head at the same time. A big paragraph, basically all stuff about, I have no interest in you, and the reason I said no earlier was blah blah blah. My literal, autistic view of the world had interpreted her soft, gentle rejection as a maybe, yes for sure. Since I don't get social cues, this was clearly my fuck up. And she didn't know I had this condition, but still, having all that joy, being granted the one thing I dreamed of, fantasized for hours about each and every day for three years given to me, handed to me like the most wonderful gift, and then cruelly ripped away two hours later, was the most agonizing thing in the world. I wasn't quite sure if I felt sad. I didn't feel angry. I just felt broken. Empty, like nothing in the world mattered. Everything I cared about or wanted in life was taken from me right there, and that nothing in the world really mattered. Take this moment to remember that for homework, I was halfway through reading My Twisted World, the story of Elliot Roger. I just kind of drifted through the rest of the day broken. I responded to her, lying, saying it was all okay while at the same time begging for her to just give me a chance. And that I was different once she got to know me. Which is true, my Asperger's makes me act very different around groups of people I don't like, and being alone with one person I do like would drastically change my personality. None of it worked. I went home and cried multiple times, even made a half-assed, no way it would have ever worked suicide attempt of holding my head under the bathwater trying to drown myself. Of course, I came up for air after a minute and a half, and I think it's impossible to drown yourself that way because of survival instincts. I was also breathing really heavily and got lightheaded. I went to bed and cried some more. The next day is what really fucked me up for good. I spent the entire day trying not to cry, in a kind of hopeless daze. I was also reading the manifesto. And in my emotional state, you can imagine how sympathetic Elliot becomes when you're that fucking distraught. I would still never do what he did though, disclaimer again. At one point, she even came up to the study room where I was doing this and chatted to her friends. I took a break from the manifesto and took the opportunity to watch Elliot's entire backlog of YouTube videos, which were somehow not blocked on the super strict YouTube censor bot the school used. 
I looked at her so desperately, and I was on the verge of tears the entire time. In one video, Elliot sits alone and listens to the song Heaven is a Place on Earth in his car, and to this day, I can't hear that song without breaking down in tears, or at least having to turn it off, because she was right across from me as I watched these videos. The next lesson we had was English, a lesson I had with her. This was the real climax of this narrative arc. We all sat down and the teacher even handed out cakes. At this point, the teacher was really nice and was a favorite teacher of many of us. We always looked forward to those lessons, but I couldn't take it. Laura was right across from me. She was so beautiful and I couldn't stand not being with her. I tried to force the cake down, but I started retching. I think that means, uh, you know, when you throw up with no vomit, yeah, retching. I did this about twice, breathing very heavily. At this point, I had full-on, extremely intense panic attack at, as the sheer life-shattering terror of not having her be my wife and one true love enveloped me. I just sat there crying and gasping for air until the teacher urged me to get up and leave. I could barely stand, but I ran out and to some office they'd set aside for emotional breakdowns. It was a school for teenagers, so of, so of course that was a thing. I just sat in there, crying and trying to rationalize it. I slowly managed to half calm down. The English teacher, who at this point I still thought was a nice person, came to talk to me to see what was up. She claimed people were worried about me, and I insisted that wasn't true, and that not one of those people cared about me one bit. She then told me that Laura was crying too. I imagined this was her realizing the emotional power she held over me. She was and is a wonderful person, and knowing she upset me so much must have hurt her too. Retard me thought that I could actually trust this English teacher to be a decent person, and I confided in her about how I'd asked Laura to go out with me, and how she'd crushingly rejected me. She acted nice to my face about it, of course. I, I ended up going home and found out the fucking school had called my parents to tell them I'd had an emotional breakdown. I just lied to them and told them it was no big deal, and the school was blowing it out of proportion. I then saw on Twitter that Laura had made a post about wanting her mom to hug her, so clearly the whole thing had deeply upset both of us. I just wanted her love more than anything in the world. It was at this time that the English teacher started being a real horrid bitch to me. Really a foul whore and incredibly spiteful. She's, she, uh, she's lay into me for typing too loudly and refusing to believe that that's just what my laptop sounded like. She yelled at me for breathing too loud and every single lesson she'd actually get the school to phone my parents at home to complain about these things. This only made them more and more angry that the school was wasting their time complaining about completely bullshit things. Over the time this happened to the end of the English lesson saga, I would always be on the verge of a panic attack in those situations in those lessons. And when Laura messaged uh, when Laura mentioned kissing a stranger once, I had to get up and leave in a fury, imagining getting revenge on whoever that person was. I did manage to wish her a happy birthday, which she accepted, but she seemed scared when I said it to her, so I don't know how she felt about me actually saying it. I still know her birthday off by heart, and I can remember it better than a lot of family members' ones. The English lesson saga came to a close when that teacher outright refused to carry on teaching me and threw me out of her lessons, mainly for typing too loudly. My parents even had to play the autism card to stop them throwing me out of the school. The school then had to pay a tutor to give me lessons alone since I was too emotionally unstable to be around the others. They kept asking me if I wanted a tutor to myself, trying to make me think it was my idea and agree to it. I could tell this was an autism kid mind game and saw right through it. I kept lying about how I was fine and I think I benefit from being in the class. That wasn't true. I hate being around people and fucking hated being in class so much. I just didn't want to be taken away from Laura. I loved her and I wanted nothing more uh, to stay in those lessons so I could keep loving, longingly gazing at her sweet, pretty face. In the end, they dropped all pretense of this 
being my choice and simply made me have separate classes. At this point, I almost never saw Laura and would savor every second she was near me in a hallway or study room. I remember when she walked past me and she smelled like marshmallows and I just wanted to be with her so badly. Over a period of time, she'd block me over multiple social media. Not all at once. She'd unfollow me on Twitter, then a week later block me on Facebook, then block me on Twitter, etc. etc. I don't know why she did it that way, or why she picked it then to do it. Weeks after, I freaked out. I had stalked some pictures off her Facebook just the day before, but there isn't a way to tell if someone looks at your Facebook, so I think that was just bad luck. The only thing she forgot to block me on was my alt Twitter shitposting account. She knew it was me, but just forgot to block it, I guess, so I still follow her. And Instagram. I was glad of that one, because I can still see pictures of her. I haven't seen any for over a year. And I haven't checked to uh, see if she later blocked me there, too, but I don't want to find out. She almost never posted to it anyway, so I think she just hasn't put anything up on there for me to see. This lead me to having a very strange relationship with Instagram, only working up the courage every few weeks to check my feed, always simultaneously excited that I'll get to see a picture of her, and sheer terror that she'll post a picture of her with a boyfriend. That would really drive me into a dark, angry headspace and possibly make me consider suicide, or wild plots about tracking her down and begging her to take me instead, and winning her over with determination. If you think that was bad, I now come to introducing an entirely new story element, which is when I had to go around looking at universities to try out. I couldn't speak to Laura enough to find out where she was going and to follow her to that university, but she was starting to hate me at this point, so it probably wouldn't have worked out too well. I went to look around one nearby, and on the guided tour of the place I met another girl, Mary. I noticed how pretty she was, and since I didn't have anyone else to obsess over while I was there, I just latched onto her for the day. I even heard her talking about how her and her mom had to go to a talk about a course, and that was the exact same course I was there for. If my dad hadn't spoken to her and her mom, I wouldn't have even got to speak to her. That's how nervous and pathetic I am, that my dad had to start the conversation for me. We kind of awkwardly talked to the two of them for a while, and as we were walking around, her fingertips touched mine for a second. Well, I did this on purpose, but it was in a natural context, so there's uh, no way she noticed. It was amazing! She seemed nice, but actually getting to touch her fingertips was like a shock, and for the rest of the day, I was completely infatuated with her. When we went to a talk, I even sat next to her so her mom couldn't, and it was really nice. She spoke to me like I mattered, and it felt so good. I didn't find out her name that day. That will come later. I did follow her around a lot while we were there, though, and I forced a lot of conversation with her. The most fateful moment was when I asked her if she liked the university we'd just seen, and she said yes. But she'd previously looked around a better one she preferred and gave me the name. This is important, and knowing how attached I get, she'll probably end up regretting telling me that, but I hope with all my heart right now that she won't, that won't end up happening. Still having no idea what her name was and no way to track her down online, I went home and masturbated while thinking about her and how nice she'd been to me. This just shows further how quickly I get attached to people and would think about her on and off for quite a long time afterwards, and specifically about how adorable her front teeth looked, and how her slight overbite made her look like a rabbit in the cutest way you can imagine. But back to the main narrative. Laura clearly hated me by this point, and she started to get really creeped out and offended by my autistic quirks, most of which I wasn't aware I was doing. They called my parents into the school to yell at them about what I was doing wrong, despite the fact I was 18, a legal adult, and they could have just told me to my face. But no. I was accused of messaging her. I had proof I hadn't done so since she last initiated a conversation with me, when she rejected me. Of following her. I had only gone to lessons we had together, and apart from that, all I'd done is stare at her when she voluntarily entered the room I was in. They also criticized me for laughing at her jokes, to my defense, 
uh, my defense to this in my head is that if she doesn't want people to laugh, she shouldn't be so charming and delightful all the time. The point of jokes is to laugh at them. Apparently, her parents even threatened to call the cops on me, but I don't really know for sh what for or what crime they could possibly claim against me. Over this time period, I would, ha I would have multiple panic attacks. One time when she saw me staring right at her, she told me something along the lines of, Come on, stop staring at me. We all know what you're doing. She was trying to be nice and kind of funny about it, rather than yelling at me. Just hearing this made me break down crying and curl up into a ball until staff came up and made me go to the receptionist's desk. She always vanished as soon as I started having an emotional breakdown, and I'm pretty sure she always went and got a teacher to help and told them she'd upset me again. I have no proof of that, but it's nice to think and fairly believable, since how else would they know? I managed to half calm down until the teacher came to talk to me and asked, did Laura upset you? At which point I just collapsed into a fit of wailing, hopeless tears and just sat there in the reception, weeping, waiting for my parents, who the school had called again to come and take me home to calm down. I just sat there cuddling my coat, which was the closest thing I had to a person to hold and comfort me. After that point, Laura re refused to even stay in the same room as me. I'm not sure if this was her idea, or the teacher's, or both, but every time I'd walk into a room, she'd just get up and leave. This hurt me so badly. I just wanted to offer to leave so she could stay, or just tell her to stay. It okay. I didn't mind, but I couldn't. I still wish I'd told her I loved her to her face. I never said those words, and even after all this, I just wanted her to know I loved her. Get ready to roll your eyes and watch me learn fucking nothing from my past mistakes. Again, we bring back in the other plot thread, the one with Mary. She told me about another university and how much nicer it was, and I went to look around that one. I don't know why I expected her to be there. Maybe I thought she'd go to a second open day because she liked it so much. I knew it was insane, but I was let down anyway. I did love the university, though, and applied. While I did like it better than the other one anyway, I can genuinely say that the main reason, the overwhelming main reason why I applied to that one was because she said she'd liked it. And she was so pretty and nice that I just wanted to go to the same one she was going to so she'd meet me and recognize me and be my best friend and fall in love with me. This was, my, this was the second choice of education institution that I have made based on my romantic infatuations rather than actually how good the school is. One more anecdote that shows just how deeply I was enthralled with Laura was uh, when I had a school trip for drama. She had a younger sister who was about two years younger than her, but they looked almost like identical twins. Pictures of Mumkey and Patchy show they almost look the same, and it was a resemblance that close. I spend the whole day gazing at her sister instead, and thinking how much she looked like Laura. It was just a proxy for me to be attracted to. The closest I had actually, I had to actually staring at the girl I liked. It was strange, and I went home very emotional after the whole thing. I resisted the urge to masturbate over her when I got home on the rationalization that that's your sister-in-law. I was still clinging to the fantasy that me and Laura would be married one day. I couldn't really find anywhere to put this in that felt natural, but it's worth noting that I was bullied very badly for years by many people. And generally, everyone disliked or hated me, which is why any attention or just human decency from an attractive girl was so valuable to me. They basically kept me and Laura apart after that. All I could do was gaze at her when I walked past. They even made a special exemption that could take my A-levels, exams you have to take at 18, in a room by myself so that I couldn't have a panic attack in the exam room looking at her pretty, wonderful head from a distance. I saw her again at some point in the summer holidays. There was a fireworks display on in, my, in the local town. We don't celebrate 4th of July. It was just a random midsummer event. Yeah, I figured. And I went to see it with my mum. After it was over, we walked down to the bandstand, which is a wooden gazebo where they sometimes played music. As I looked at the kids they'd got playing the music, a lot of people I knew, and one of them was Laura's sister. I knew she must be around here somewhere, in the crowd or at least chance, 
So even when my mom suggested we go, I insisted otherwise. I just wanted to see Laura one more time. Finally, I saw her talking to her, da to her dad. God, she was so pretty and wonderful. I just stared. This time, this time, that was all it took. Not me talking to her, not her rejecting me or anything like that. Each time it took less stimulus, but simply looking at her, just seeing her, I had another intense panic attack and ended up crying on the ground in front of a whole crowd of people, some of whom knew me. I didn't give a fuck. I was too upset to give a fuck what they thought. I begged my mum to not let my dad, to not tell my dad how upset I'd gotten when we got home. Not because I was afraid of how he'd react, just because he'd be really concerned and go on about it and try to talk to me about it. I didn't want to hear about how there were plenty of girls out there. I didn't want to hear how I had my whole life ahead of me. I wanted Laura, and that was all I cared about in the world. After I calmed down, me and my mum started walking back to the car. On the way back, I saw Laura and some of her friends and family walking on the other side of the road. She was holding hands with some fuckboy-looking cunt I didn't recognize! Not from our school. It took all of my inner insanity to convince myself in that moment that it was either her cousin or a friend of her sister's. If I hadn't managed to tell myself that, I would have gone over and tried to beat the shit out of him. I just went home and cried some more. Our school had a leaving party, which was an informal prom kind of thing at a local venue. I paid six pounds, or six euros? Six pounds? For a ticket, just in case Laura was going. She wasn't, and in the end I wasted the money. But it was worth it for the chance. The chance to have four more hours to look at her lovely, sweet face. I hated the whole experience. Hated it. I hate parties. I hate socializing. And my other medical condition that fucks with me if I don't sit in the right way hurt and bothered me all night. They also had some rowdy chavs, trailer trash of the UK, come in uninvited and stood by the bar, which made me too frightened to go over and order any kind of soft drink. The show Talk Time with Asperger put me off ever drinking alcohol, thanks Brandon. So I was thirsty all night. I hated every miserable second of that party, even refused a girl who begged me to dance with her. It was clearly out of pity and I didn't want to dance because I felt too awkward and autistic to do so. Whenever the chance to dance socially comes by, I feel like all the energy is sucked from me, making all music into shoegaze. When I wanted it to end, I spent a lot of the time trying to be near and talk to some other random girl who I thought was kinda cute but was too preoccupied with Laura to get obsessed with. She left halfway through the party to go to Spoons, a chain of pubs or bars as Americans would say, and that left me even more miserable at my romantic chances. With no one to perv over, I just imagined having sex with her the rest of the night. Um, okay, I scrolled down by accident. Too far. Okay. Uh, by the way, to the guy who wrote this, I don't know if you'll ever see this, but if you do, you should send me a photo of Laura's face! Let me decide if this is truly the most beautiful girl in the world worth obsessing over to this degree. Folks, when you send in these stories obsessing over these girls, you gotta show me what they look like! I won't show them on screen without your permission! No, it's not fucking finished. We've still got, like, half an hour to go, it looks like. Anyway. I only saw Laura one more time after any of this at a six-month reunion, which was just an excuse to collect our A-level certificates. Americans have a whole ceremony about graduation, but for us, they just handed them out on a pile or sent them to you in the post if you didn't show up. Laura was there for hers and just spoke to her friends. Her mom was there too, but didn't notice me. Whenever I had seen her mother in the past, I always thought it was her grandma since she looked about 75 years old but I later found out it wasn't her grandma at all. I tried the whole time to stare at Laura as much as possible. I knew this was the last time I'd ever see her in my life, most likely, and I just wanted to remember every wonderful detail of her. 
Seeing her again reminded me of all the little quirks she had that I couldn't get just looking at the pictures of her I stalked off of social media. The way she spoke in an awkward, deliberate speech pattern, the way she moved her eyes when she laughed. I did everything I could to look at her as much as possible, and the whole experience of being back in the school I hated, seeing the people who I f uh, fucking hated for years, again, really messed with me. The only reason I even went to the shitty reunion was because I wanted to see her again. And these was a chance, uh, there was a chance she'd be there. I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't have any friends I missed. No one I wanted to see but her. In fact, I only caught up with teachers who I liked and chatted to a few. The people who I actually had the best relationships with were all the adult staff. That's how much of a fucking friendless loser I was. I had absolutely no desire to talk to or interact with any of the people except Laura, and she was busy talking with her friends. There was a single moment where I was going to get up, go over and just tell her to her face that I loved her. Just say that I know she didn't like me, but I needed her to know that I loved her. But I thought my parents would probably stop me, so I didn't. I regret that to this day, and I really want her to know. After the summer, it was finally time to start university. This is where the last plot thread comes in. It turned out my plan had actually worked. I had managed to be at the same university and on the same course as Mary, the girl I met before. I had actually looked in great detail through the Facebook profiles of all the people in the course group chat that had been set up before we met in person, hoping to find her. However, I had missed her because she looked Chinese in the picture she used. She's white, but for some reason she looks Chinese in pictures. I don't know, it's weird. I thought I saw her the day I moved in, but since I was desperate to see her that day, it was entirely plausible that it was just some random girl that kind of looked like her. However, once I started the actual course, it was clear. I had actually managed to end up in the same university and course as her. I had serious doubts as to whether student debt was even worth it, but the thought of falling in but the thought of her falling in love with me was worth going to university over, worth 21 grand. I actually approached her and asked her if she recognized me, and she did. I asked her name and offered to hang out with her. She gave a vague, maybe sometime answer that I tried to be positive about, but I walked away. When I walked away, I felt so excited. My legs felt weak, and I felt like I was going to fall over just from sheer excitement from talking to a girl as sweet and attractive as her, and who was interested in exactly the same thing I was since we were on the same creative-based course. There were a few small red flags, like she believed that psychics and fortune-telling were real, but overall she seemed wonderful. While Laura has the most emotional effect on me, and I still love her more deeply than anyone, it was clear that on a personality and interest level, this new girl was absolutely the most suitable girlfriend material I have ever met. On a compatibility level, she's just right for me. Now you have to think about what my autistic plan was versus reality. I had thought about how we were going to meet and fall in, in love in some depth. And my plan was to try and get to be friends with her first. And if I could be her main friend, try to get her to hang out with me the most and neglect having anyone else in her life. She'd naturally fall in love with me and we'd spend the rest of our lives together. I hope she's not a monkey fan or I'm fucked when she hears this, but whatever. She's not. <laughs> this, this is a cute girl at your college? I promise you she's not a monkey fan. Don't you worry, my friend. The only flaw in this plan is that I am so autistic that I have no understanding of social ability. I don't know how to make friends. I don't know how to keep friends. I don't know how to talk to people. I tried so hard, so hard to make her like me. And she does seem to like and care about me to a degree but not enough to talk to me. That is to say, she never speaks to me. I have to talk to her first to make her even acknowledge me. This is the way with most people, but she doesn't seem to want to talk to me unless I drag her into it. Even if I wanted friends, I have no idea how I'd make them. Like, when you're in a lecture, you can't socialize because the lecturer is talking, and after the lecture, you go home. If I spoke to anyone, it'd seem weird and cloying. Like these people don't know me. Who am I to talk to them? 
I don't understand how these people have friends already. We have only been here half a year, and for me anyway, I've barely said more than one line of dialogue to even 25% of people in the course, and others I've never had any reason or chance to talk to. Again, I don't give a fuck about friends, only having a lovely girlfriend, but I still find myself amazed at how these people just manage to make friends out of random peers. Uh, it's totally and utterly a mystery to me since I never learned social skills, despite going to public school. I don't think homeschooling would have fucked me up so bad since I didn't learn social skills anyway. All it would do is save me from having the emotional scars I have from bullying and having uh, my heart torn apart. But anyway, I plan to make her my one best friend without any idea how to do this. And most days, I was scared to sit next to her in case she got creeped out by it. I tried everything. At least, in the same way Elliot tried everything to get a girlfriend. When you're this socially inept, you don't realize your version of everything is actually barely anything to neurotypicals. Whatever I was supposed to do to make friends, I don't know what it was. Just like Elliot didn't know uh, he was meant to speak to girls to get a girlfriend. Well, all I did was try and awkwardly make conversation every week, or perhaps every two weeks with her. I can't speak to girls unless they're alone, since they're always closer to their bastard friends than me, and this was no different. I only had around one chance to speak to her a week, and if some other person got to her first, I had no chance. When I did talk to her, it was forced... Uh, when I did talk to her, it was forced, and since I don't know how to have conversations with people my own age, I'm okay with talking to people I view as authority figures, like parents, teachers, and just fully grown adults. It was always very generic shit, like, how are you, and that was it. And I could only keep up with it for a minute before I ran out of things to say, and she'd leave. Okay, one second. We've still got, like, a lot of paragraphs to go. I think this one story has been going on for over an hour now. Yeah, I need, I need to look up the word count on this. Okay, where do we leave off? It's just a huge wall of text. Where the fuck did I leave off? Okay. Uh, hopefully I didn't already read this. When I did talk to her, it was forced, and since I don't know how to have conversations with people my own age, I'm okay with talking to people I view as authority figures, like parents, teachers, and just fully grown adults. It was always very generic shit. Okay, like, how are you, and what was that? And I could only keep up with it for about a minute before I ran out of things to say, and she'd leave. I already had it in my head that she would be my wife and love me, and although I tried very weakly to resist the urge, I totally and utterly fell for her. And I do think I love her. Anyway, it was after around two months go by that I keep doing this. There are two or three other guys who seem to talk to her on a semi-regular basis, and I soon grew furiously jealous of all of them, and developed deep burning hatreds for all of them. It was two months later from when I met her again, starting university, that the whole thing came back to fuck me over again. I was talking to her and desperately trying to think of things to say so she wouldn't just go back to her phone, so I asked what the stamp on her hand was from. She happily launched into a story about going out with her boyfriend at the weekend. Just typing that world was hard for me. Just typing that word was hard for me, I assume you meant. Fuck him. 
fuck him. I hope he suffers a life of loneliness and misery for what he did to me. Cunt. How could this happen? How? I just kind of ended the conversation and drifted off into a spiral daze. I tried to reason with myself. Come on. It's only been two months. Just move on. It's good you found out now. But no, that wasn't good enough. We were meant to be together. It was destiny. We'd met by chance at another university and ended up here, together. That was fate. She even believes in fortune-telling bullshit. If anything is fate telling us she should be with me, it's that. I wasn't even that deeply obsessed, I thought. I still wanted Laura more than anything else, but it was just being tired of it. Of having three and a half years of obsession with one girl shattered to pieces. Of being rejected so thoroughly by everyone, I just couldn't take it. I barely knew Mary, but, it was, but she was just perfect. She hadn't even rejected me, just let me know that she wasn't currently available. But that was enough. For about ten minutes I just stared into space, a dead look in my eye, trying to rationalize this tragedy. Someone even asked me if I was okay, and I just lied and said I was. I couldn't take it anymore. I broke down crying in front of her, and much like many times before, I had a panic attack as my entire world crumbled around me. I just got up and left, and cried in the corridor outside. <sighs> Some woman who worked at the university tried to make me feel better, and I told her about my Asperger's uh, to get some mental health pity points, and just sat there on the verge of tears for two and a half hours. After the session time was actually done with, everyone left, and I got uh, up to go too. But Mary was actually there. Having a girl I liked actually care about me, show compassion and pity at my mental breakdown meant the world to me. My sweet Mary actually cared about me, enough to not ignore me. I know just from that moment of concern, I couldn't ever consider giving up on making her love me. I could never do anything to hurt her, and that we were supposed to be together. If, anything, if anyone else had asked me why I was upset, and some did later, I would have just lied and said it was nothing, but I couldn't lie to her. When she asked me why I was upset, I just wanted to tell her I loved her. I managed to get out. I just really, really like you, and when you said you have a boyfriend, it really upset me. The look of pure, sad pity on her face is the warmest, nicest expression I have seen in my life. Never have I seen more care and concern concern shown towards me, as she realized not only was I deeply emotionally upset, but that it was her fault that she'd caused me to feel this way. She was so nice about it. She even offered to still be friends with me, and I just burst into tears again, and told her about how no one had been my friend for nearly a decade. She was so sweet and understanding. I left in utter misery. All right. Let's do a timeout. We got some drama in the chat. People getting upset. What's the fucking problem in this chat? Who's this person that's making everybody so upset? Yeah, I wanted to save this drama for after this big story, but I keep getting all these fucking messages about it. Nothing. Okay, somebody is friends with uh, Asperger and Jackie. Okay. So what? Someone's claiming I lied about Asperger. Okay, yeah. As soon as you post any piece of evidence, I'd love to see it. He's accusing you of lying? Uh, <laughs> you should not assume their gender. <laughs> That's nothing? Okay. Well, people, you people know the true story. So if this bitch is just making up shit, feel free to ban them every single time while I'm reading this story, because I can't address it while I'm reading this shit. Uh, if some dumb bitch wants to s accuse me of lying, she can say it to my face, not in a fucking chat. Oh, you were there for all of it! Oh, I'm glad you sat there and watched Jackie get beat, you dumb bitch. Get the fuck out of my chat. 
It's gotta be sad when you lie about being there during a domestic dispute. I was there for a phone call, you dumb fucking cunt. Oh, so you were laughing in the corner while Jackie called me? While after she locked herself in a room, you fucking retard? What an idiot. These fucking sick people. Lying on behalf of domestic abuse. Guess what? Brandon is going to prison for a fucking felony. And you lying in my Twitch chat is not going to change that. Why don't you just start dating Jackie again? She's going to be single for a while. Let's get back to a good story. After I get another water. Okay. No more interruptions! No more! I gotta finish this fucking marathon story. I keep losing my spot. Where the fuck did I leave off? Ah. Uh, uh, okay, I'll just start from here even if I've already read it. I kept trying to tell myself to move on, but I couldn't. I went home and, cr and cried some more. And the people in my group work for university even told me that they didn't need me to work because they could tell I was deeply emotionally fucked at the time. It was clear, after I made myself so pathetic and vulnerable in front of her, that my one and only tactic would be to get her to be my girlfriend out of pity. I know it's a really fucking shitty approach, but I'm such an over-emotional, romantic crybaby that the make-a-girl-feel-sorry-for-you approach is all I have going for me. It didn't work for Elliot, and it won't work for me. But if I don't have that, I have nothing, and life's not worth living without a girlfriend. I had postured to myself about it before, had grandiose, ridiculous fantasies about how I'd do it. But this moment, this rejection, was the first time I ever really, genuinely, thought about how I could kill myself. Rather than thinking about jumping off a giant train bridge in a dramatic standoff, I just honestly thought about how I could actually do it. I could jump off a small bridge into heavy traffic, right near my flat. I started looking at how the anti-suicide windows in my apartment block worked to see if I could open them the right way to jump out. I started thinking about if a toaster in the shower would work, or if it had to be bathed. I looked at the bleach that cleaned the toilet and thought about just drinking a shitload, but didn't want to die so painfully. I started thinking about how you just hang a noose from the ceiling. There's nothing up there to hook it to. There's nothing strong... Uh, nothing strong enough to hold up a human body. I even watched Rusty's family-friendly news song a bunch and memorized how to make one from that. I don't actually have any rope, but I could go and get some. It wasn't just getting rejected. It wasn't just how wonderful a girl it was that did it. It was just this. After all this shit I went through as a younger teenager, all the way through college, and I just hoped university would be different, that I wouldn't be a teenager, that I'd be an adult and things wouldn't be so shitty. I'm out in the world now. I'm a human. 
Evil Jumpkey's outlook on life seemed very relatable. His rant at the end of the Love Survival Guide. Probably you making that stuff so funny is what stopped me getting so caught up in my inner fury and seeing that thinking as too retarded to unironically think for any long period of time. But I wanted her. She had to break up with him eventually, right? And I'd be her best friend by then. And she'd have to date me next. I tried to work out who it was. Every single guy that spoke to her, I ended up fucking hating with a blinding fury. How dare they get to talk to the girl that I like? After I freaked out in front of her, a few weeks later I went up and apologized for getting so upset. I didn't want to feel bad and hoped I'd get some pity points for putting guilt on myself. She was so warm and understanding, and seeing her cute, concerned little face just made me more obsessed with her. The next fucking blow to me came after the Christmas break, although I suspected it a little before. I found out the guy she was with was fucking Chad. <laughs> it sounds like a meme I fucking know, but it was literally the most fucking jock-looking, normie-tier popular guy you could possibly imagine. Picture Chad, and then think of him on steroids. That's this reprehensible cunt. He has a fucking beard. He looked exactly like the type of person that had made my entire youth a living, miserable hell from bullying me. I know the type. There was 100% for sure a kid just like me at whatever school he went to, who he tortured into a socially inept nervous wreck. He's that kind of asshole. The exact breed. The kind of alpha cunt who just fucking oozes an intimidating aura like a human pit bull. Like if you move or anger them, they'll beat the shit out of you for sport or for fun. What made me so fucking angry about this was two things. First, this girl, who I wanted, wasn't Stacy. She was fundamentally the most nerdy, awkward, almost slightly autistic, seemingly introvert you could hope for. That's why she appealed to me so much. All the dweebs and losers I'd seen her uh, be friends with, I thought one of them must be the one stealing her away from me. They were just ugly, incel-looking dorks, and I could absolutely upstage them. I don't think I'm magnificent or anything like Elliot did, but I'd say my looks are okay. I'm not self-conscious about my looks and generally think I look okay. It's not something I have any insecurities about. So those motherfuckers I could easily seem better than. But Chad? I had no chance, especially with the I'm a sad loser, please date me to make me look better card as my only move. What makes me angry is that he could have any Stacy he wanted. He could have his fucking pick of the coke-snorting, alcoholic, open relationship thoughts. Any fucking 10 out of 10 looks, 0 out of 10 personality Stacy his heart desired. Any girl. He could get any girl. So why did he have to take mine? I know what kind of person he is just by looking at him. He will 100% cheat on her and treat her like shit. He's meant to stick to Stacy's, and nerdy autistic losers like me are meant to have the weird, awkward, nerdy girlfriends. She is so lovely and sweet and perfect for me. He's not the kind of person she should be with. It doesn't even make sense. All I have left to do is join the crowd of about 15 loser beta orbiters she has and hope she likes me the most to go out with me when he finally cheats on her. Chad's go with Stacy's. Why would he go outside of his fucking sphere and take the kind, wonderful girls with substance? Fuck you. The other reason this fucking pissed me off is how? Literally how? I tried to tell myself that she must have a boyfriend from before she met me. I clung to that. But no. A month after we got to university, she'd got with him. L literally fucking how? I'd never seen them even seen them speak before. How the fuck did he manage to get her to be his girlfriend? I tried everything. I even had months of planning it out. I tried everything to make her hang out with me and be my girlfriend, fucking everything I could. Literally, how did he even manage that? It's truly fucking beyond me how it even happened. All I know is I fucking hate him, and I know he'll be, he'll fucking mistreat her. I realize I'm actually unironically sad here. Uh, raging that she picked an obnoxious brute over a supreme gentleman like me. 
But when I act, but that actually does fucking happen to you in, but when that actually does fucking happen to you in real life, it really does seem like a lot more of a hurtful injustice. Now all I can do is sit near her in the one class we have together and desperately try to make her be closer friends with me. But I have literally zero idea of how to make her hang out with me by choice outside of university. This whole thing has made me utterly miserable and I can't even bring myself to sign up for online dating because I want her. I've already met someone perfectly matched for me, beautiful and with interests and personality that is literally just right for me. And she won't see uh, me how I see her. At least she doesn't hate my guts yet. Give it time. I'll find a way to sufficiently creep her out, even if it's as simple as just looking at her too long. She'll fucking end up hating me. I know it. I've tried finding a creative outlet for my misery, but all my stories and stuff end up with violent revenge themes. I wouldn't do it IRL, disclaimer. Like a lot of the leaked fictional works of uh, Sing Hu Cho. I don't know how to pronounce Cho's first two names, but it's Cho. Those are actually a good read, but man, do you come up with fucked stories when you feel like this? I don't ask for much. I don't ask for friends. I don't ask for a social life. I don't ask for partying or popularity. All I want is one single attractive girl to be my loving, warm companion. Just once. Uh, one single girlfriend. I don't ask for much. I don't have a single friend in the world and I don't fucking want one as long as I can have a girlfriend. Not a big ask, is it? I always scoffed at the New Age theory that this world is actually hell. But recently, after this one last heartbreak, I'm really starting to think the entire world is specifically designed to torture me in particular. My fucking Asperger's means everyone sees a whole level of social depth and understanding I just don't have. They, they get to want friends, have them, actually enjoy being around them without a kind of social anxiety, or more accurately, social disgust that makes me want uh, to me by myself. Every single nice girl, the only people who being around doesn't make me want to claw my face off, never fucking like me, never talk to me, never love me how I love them. This whole world feels like it was built to make me miserable, even adding in people with worse lives, with starvation and misery and other mental illness, just to make me feel bad about my pity party. Like I don't deserve to be sad because a pretty girl didn't like me. But I suppose the whole point of Depression Chamber is for people to throw a pity party, so here. Hope someone actually relates to me and doesn't feel like they're uniquely screwed up. Just like I wrote this after Mumkey read Relatable Ones last time. The other day I got a for fortune cookie that told me I have a strong appeal to the opposite sex. Unless that appeal is discussed, I can only imagine that fortune was put in there to taunt me. I still dream about Laura a lot at night, so she's clearly still in my subconscious. I like it because at least I kinda sorta get to see her again for a little bit. Every single time I ever get a wish, like at birthdays or Christmas or whenever else, I always still wish she'd be my girlfriend and go out with me. Thanks if you actually read all of this whining, uh, self-indulged bullshit, Mumkey. You do amazing things and as long as I have your website to watch, it just makes things better. At least I have podcasts to drown out the sound of these hedonistic pricks and their alcohol-fueled good times with their normie friends. Can't wait for a print copy of the Triflers to come out again, and I can see how fucked up you used to be too. Thanks for reading, if you ever did. Well, after that, I, I think uh, we have to we have to call an end to this episode of Depression Chamber. I don't know how we could possibly top an hour and a half long story with so many twists and turns. Let's liven things up around here, folks.
Oh! Okay. Okay. Let's get no oath on call. They can tell it to the judge. They got something to say. Hey, if, if you got uh, information that I'm getting wrong, I, tell it to the arresting officers, tell it to uh, the lawyer, tell it to the judge, tell it to the jury. All these people need to hear it more than I do. No, don't, don't unban that bitch. Fuck that bitch. She has something to say. She can tell it to the state of Georgia. They're the one pressing the charges here, not me. Well, I was not expecting two and a half full hours of depression chamber, but that story really did take up an hour and a half. I hope that guy ends up seeing this and sees what everybody had to say. Um... Uh, he he resent the message right before this started, so I think he might have been watching. Because he resent that same story about two hours ago. I'm wondering if that story is worth posting on YouTube as its own video, but it is really long, so I don't know. The other one was, well, like 40 minutes, but at least it was... It was just crazy and had to go as its own video. Do it. Yeah, let's check the uh let's check the word count on that. My guess of word count. Everybody post your guess. I'm going to guess like 13,000. Over 9,000, yeah. Oh, okay. We have an answer. Let's see. 1 million, close. 15,000, 14,000. Over 9,000. 12,000. All right. It was 14,810. It's like five chapters in a book. The average novel is like 50,000 words. We just read a whole novella, folks. We read a whole fucking novella. Okay. Well, I think we should call it a stream. And I'll be back tomorrow probably around the same time, 11 p.m. Eastern, to do the big political compass thing. We're going to see who I should vote for in 2020. Which of the 50,000 apparent candidates for 2020 does Mumkey agree with the most? Will it be Yang Gang? Will it be Bernie? Will it be Beto the Beta? Will it be Mr. Trump himself? You're staying out that uh, you don't like politics. Do all your streams at 11 p.m. Eastern. That's when I get off work. Yeah, I could probably do that. Bernie bros. When will you do another depression chamber? I think uh, maybe this is one that I should do like every Monday, maybe. Because Monday is the most depressing day of the week. How would you guys feel about like every Monday at 11 p.m. Uh, Eastern time? You get a depression chamber. Would that be fun? Mondays? Yeah. There you go. One, one part of the schedule is figured out. Do you usually read all depression chambers that get sent in? Um, yeah, I'm reading them all in order. 
So this one was sent in like a month ago. Someone sent an escort to Wing's house. Yeah, I saw that. She said she was worried if she went back without money that she was going to get beat up by her pimp. And he said that's not his problem. <laughs> <laughs> how backed up are you uh there's probably like i don't know like 50 stories i haven't even got to yet so if you send one in don't expect to hear it anytime soon just over the course of today's stream i got another 12 Uh, it's not on a clip. It's uh, he posted it to Twitter about the escort. Unless he was streaming right now and talked about it. For the first depression chamber, it was just incel hell. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> welcome to the chamber, my friend. <laughs> that's most of these. <laughs> He was streaming when the prostitute showed up? Really? Did they send another one? Because he tweeted about it when he wasn't streaming. Well, shit, I guess I gotta go see Sean Ranklin post that video. The most embarrassing depression chamber ever? I don't, we might have just read it. <laughs> that's pretty embarrassing. I don't know. Is, can anybody else think of one that's more embarrassing than that? Did they already post a video on Sean Ranklin? <laughs> All right, we're watching this together. Don't worry, folks. I'll hook you up. We're going to watch this. End stream after an escort is sent to his house. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um... Where is my screen capture? Display capture. Uh, whatever. All right, let's watch this bad boy. Yeah, yeah, I saw the tweet. This, uh, so this was before? So then they did it again during the stream? <laughs> it's not funny. Going back to her home because someone said they would beat her for not making any money. I had to tell her this is not my problem. The fact of the matter is the cab wasn't my problem. You're affecting people's lives with these. Okay. What? Okay, I'll be up. Be right back. Yeah. Way too loud. It shouldn't be that loud. I'm sorry, folks. Wings is beating his dog. Wings is beating his dog. Uh oh. All right, guys. I have to. Guys, I support Wings. I'm not a troll. I got to leave. Um, what I tweeted about just happened again, <laughs> right? And I got to go take somebody home. Oh, no. Because they wasted $40 getting up here. So, 
At least the cab was gone this time, so I didn't have to pay for no fucking cab. But I'm about to go take these people home. People? And I don't know. This shit's ridiculous. Why would you drive them home? I'd say get the fuck off my property. Uh, I'll be back, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, well, that's what that was. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow night with more. With more streaming. Bye.